talk hunting, fishing, and everything outdoors. So pull up a seat and enjoy our campfire stories. Thanks for joining us. Hey everybody, thanks for joining me tonight. It's much appreciated. Um, sorry about that little uh, bit of a break in the action there, but was taking a little time off to do uh, some fishing and turkey hunting. But we're back at it, and uh, we got a great show for you today. So today we got Hunter Patno from Shearing Speed Sports from the Amsoil Snowcross Series. Uh, the guy's accomplished so much already and representing the Northeast here, so couldn't be uh, happier to have him on. So let's bring Hunter on here. Hey, Hunter, how's it going tonight? How you doing? Good, how are you? Hey, first off, uh, congratulations on your engagement. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Any, uh, you have a date set yet? Yeah, September 18th, uh, 2021. So Cool. Getting, getting things planned for that, and yeah, we're just, I mean, we're excited to, to get the ball rolling and to, to get married. So uh, is that going to interfere with your season? When, you when do you start your season, like with uh, practice and stuff like that? So the team that I race for, uh, Shearing Speed Sports, we're pretty fortunate with them. Um, and he, so Steve Shearing, who is the owner of the team, he has snow guns and all sorts of equipment. So he's got excavators, a bulldozer to break up the track. And, um, I mean, the excavators we can use too to, to kind of move snow around if it gets to a place where we don't want it or if we want to shorten up the track. And, uh, yeah, he's got a couple groomers too, so... All right, we're we're pretty well set up there, and he's got a big pond, um, so everything's everything's pretty much set up just perfect. Uh, we got the shop right next to it, so we can we can work on our sleds in there, and uh, we just bring them in and out. And yeah, he's able to to blow snow. Usually, he he uh he really pushes the limits on that and uh, tries to get snow as early as possible, and you know just to to make it possible for us to start riding and and kind of get that edge on on everybody else because you know two weeks of riding or two weeks of testing is is pretty huge so usually usually when we get out there it's um i guess the beginning of uh november end of october so yeah right around there is, is when we're able to to go out there and start riding because i mean in aurora minnesota it gets pretty cold so it's it's pretty much always cold around there i don't think i've ever been there when it was when it was above 50 so um yeah we're, we're pretty fortunate to have him as a as a team owner and uh definitely grateful to have all the equipment that he has yeah no doubt that sounds awesome yeah because uh i actually wanted to get up that way to do some ice fishing some really good ice <laughs> fishing up in those parts yeah so uh yeah there's a lot of people that do i mean we know there's a bunch of people that come to the shop and, and we know a few of them that, that are going ice fishing every once in a while too so um yeah I, Ice fishing is uh, is something I've never done, but uh, I've heard a lot of fun about it. And you know, a lot of the times people tell me that they have a lot of fun because they're drinking beer. But in the middle <laughs> of the season, I'm not really able to to be doing that stuff. So yeah, no doubt. So like uh, on the off season, are you working out? Yeah. Yep. So we we have, or I have a personal trainer at home, Adrian Geyer with XIP Training, and. Uh, He's based out of Lindenville, Vermont, which is about an hour and 20 minutes north of of where I live, which is in Heartland, Vermont. And, um, yeah, so I train with him five days a week and then, I mean, just try to try to beat my body down as much as possible and build as much strength. And right now it's a lot more uh, strength focused and just trying to get my body back into the swing of things and, um, you know, get – get the muscles moving again and kind of just get everything prepared for what's to come and uh, try to build a, build a solid base for the, the hard off season. And um, yeah, so right now it's a lot of, a lot of kind of eccentric stuff and uh, yeah, just a lot, a lot of cardio, a lot of endurance and um, mostly strength stuff too. So uh, yeah, it's, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to be getting after it pretty hard in the gym and um yeah, it's probably it's probably going to be just another brutal off season, so it's going to be good. Cool. So you uh, you grew up in Vermont? Yep. Yep. Nice. Uh, yeah, because uh, it's it's kind of cool that the thing that why I'm a big fan of yours is like you represent the Northeast. You know, for years we've been mm -hmm. watching guys from like Canada and out in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And it's cool to have uh, you and Lincoln, right? Yep. Are, yep. Now, did you guys know each other before you're on the same team? 
Uh, we did, but only through some kind So we didn't know each other outside of racing. That's kind of how we got um, we got introduced was racing. So uh, when we raced Rock Maple Racing, which was before ECS, which was then before ECS, or er, before ECS, which was then before um, ESXT, that was um, kind of where we first started. That so that was the first circuit that we ever raced on, and then and then it got sold um, a few different times after that. So um, yeah, so we got introduced through through Rock Maple Racing and, and through the racing there, and um, I always just looked up to him as a racer and kind of tried to mimic what he would do on a snowmobile because I mean he was a young kid and um, he he was going out there and, and beating all the older guys so. Um, yeah, I think it was really fun for me to be able to watch him and uh, I'm definitely grateful that I was able to, to learn from him and to kind of have him take me under his wing and, um, yeah, just kind of learn his knowledge and, and learn what he does on and off the track too. So, I mean, like the guy's got a lot of knowledge and I mean, I have nothing but respect for him and I'm just grateful that, uh, that I was able to learn from him and, you know, be around him and be a part of his program and him a part of mine and um yeah just just happy that i'm that i'm able to work with him and um keep growing as a racer and uh just glad to have his support too cool yeah because uh i'm rooting for you guys <laughs> yeah yeah so, thank you appreciate it so uh what how, how old were you started riding snowmobiles so i was seven i was seven the first day that i raced a snowmobile but oh, wow. so the racing is it was um, Saturdays and Sundays, but my birthday, I was seven on Saturday, but my birthday was on Sunday. So technically I started racing when I was seven, but I was really eight. So um, yeah, I was just just a young kid. And I mean, my brother, he started racing a year before I did just because I wasn't old enough to get onto a big sled at that point. Right. And my dad didn't want to dump all the money into a, a little 120 where those things are nothing but nothing but a stress ball. So uh, we we didn't really want to get into that. So uh, I waited an extra year and just kind of was a mechanic for my brother and helped him, brought him to the line a couple times. And um, I mean, I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. I don't even. I mean, it was all just fun and games at that point. We were just excited to be able to to be racing and to hang out with our friends. And I mean, it was. It was just like going out to recess um, at school, except it was all weekend and we got to ride snowmobiles. So, um, yeah, it was it was mainly just for fun, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was a good time, and it was something. It was it was really cool for us to be able to spend that time as a family and uh, to be able to bring bring our family closer too. So, uh, definitely definitely cool experience to have, and um, it's a great family sport for sure. So it was all local up in Vermont. Um, so the, my first race was in Wyndham, New York. Get out of here. And, That's, I live right around the corner. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, we were, I, I'm pretty sure my first race was Wyndham, New York. I'm, I'm pretty set in that. Yeah, no um, doubt. So, uh, yeah, my, my first race actually, it probably was, I mean, for a little kid that was just getting into racing, I think the worst possible thing that could have happened to me happened to me and uh so i think it was my first day of racing and i mean at that point i had no idea like what it meant to be riding against other snowmobiles so right. i had I, I never really experienced it i never even experienced racing at the time so i was just going out there and i had no idea what to do i mean i had a pretty good idea because i'd watched it and um i was obviously a big fan of it and i had i had my idols and, and the people that i looked up to and um, I mean, I just tried to go out there and, and make it around the track and I came up on the top of the hill and there was a big bowl turn and then the sled came up the inside of me and I, I, I didn't know what to do at the time. I was just, I mean, it was my first time ever racing the snowmobile and I, I clipped his track and ended up tipping over and I, my sled flipped down the bank. So I was trying so hard to, to flip my sled back up and I just remember I, w I was trying so hard to get my sled back up on, on two skis and I was looking back at the flagger and I was like, come on, man, are you going to come help me or not? And, uh, finally it took me, I think about two minutes to, to get my sled back up, but I did it. 
I got it, got it by myself, a little eight year old kid trying to flip a full size home build back <laughs> over. So, um, I mean, <laughs> at that point, I don't know why, but I think that just made me love it that much more. Um, I think, I think now a, a lot of people might, or a lot of little kids might just see their snowmobile flipped over and, and they might, uh, they might just kind of walk away or wait for, wait for somebody to come and help them. But, um, luckily I had a, a really good upbringing from my parents and, uh, they taught me to never quit. And so, yeah, it was kind of, that was, that was pretty much my mentality there. And, uh, just try to get my snowmobile put back over and, uh, try to, try to give it everything I had. Cool. Was there, was there ever, uh, dirt bikes or did you ever race motocross at all? Um, I never, when I was little, before I started racing, uh, snowmobiles, we had dirt bikes, but I never raced them. Um, I was never, I was never really talented on a dirt bike for whatever reason. I just, I mean, it never, it never fit me. So I would always struggle to, to get comfortable on them and to, to be able to, like find the comfortability to actually go fast and, and hit the bumps because it's such a high speed sport. And I mean, snowmobiles is too, but it's probably just something with the control and I mean, two wheels compared to, to two skis and a track. So, um, I never really got into racing at a young age. And then, so what I did was I, I started racing snowmobiles and then uh, I think a couple of years after I started racing, I actually started racing mountain bikes. Oh, and cool. my brother, my brother raced, he raced their bikes. And so my, my dad kind of gave us the option. He was like, all right, well, I mean, we have mountain bikes. And at the time my neighbor was, was racing mountain bikes. And <clears throat> I really looked up to him too. And, um, kind of wanted to do what he did as well. And then I wanted to, do what he did so uh, i started racing mountain bikes and i did that for about i think three years or four years and uh i mean i had some pretty good success for a little kid um nothing nothing major um and uh yeah then i don't know i think i just got sick of sick of pedaling all the time so then i started uh started riding dirt bikes and i did race dirt bikes for a couple years um from about when i was probably 13 till I was, uh, I'd say 15 or so. And then, and then, I mean, I, I would try so hard on a dirt bike cause I mean, that's, that's my, that's all I know. I just, I just want to try hard and I want to go fast, but I was never good enough and I never had the talent to be able to actually go fast on a motorcycle. So I would just end up crashing and end up, um, you know, just, not not serious injuries, but just tweaking my body a little bit, and I mean, I kind of had to humble myself a little, uh, for a little bit there, and um, just accept the fact that I was not good on a dirt bike. So, yeah. well, it's funny because yeah. you know, uh, I grew up, you know, upstate New York, and you know, same deal. We had snowmobiles at a young age. Uh, I raced motocross, but it's like when I watch you guys on those big <laughs> sleds, it's like to me, it would be the opposite. It'd be like you know. You figure you guys would be really fast on a bike, but it's amazing yeah. like how you guys throw those things through the air and you guys are flying. Yeah, yeah I definitely wouldn't say that uh, the snowmobiles are easier to ride than or easier to race than a than a dirt bike is. Um, I mean, it's it's its own animal in a different way. Absolutely. So, um, I mean, dirt dirt bikes are brutal for sure. I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like racing dirt bikes is easy because I know that's a tough sport. Um, but for, for snowmobiles, it's a whole different, whole different, uh, animal out there. And, you know, the, the track is constantly changing the way that the snow moves. Uh, there's nothing on a motorcycle, on a motocross track or a supercross track that could really replicate that. So, um, I mean, what we have in, in snowcross is, is something that you, I think is one of the most unpredictable, um, you know, course, uh, course. Um, just the way that the snow is. I mean, right. unless you were you were bringing like sea dews in, I imagine. I mean, the ocean's probably more unpredictable than a little bit of snow. But um, yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's always changing every single lap, and to be able to to kind of analyze the track as you're racing it and and recognize how it's changing. And I mean, there's there's a there's a lot that goes into to racing a snowmobile too. It's not just going out there and hitting the gas and grabbing a little bit of break and then turning in the corners. Yeah, right. Yeah, because it's, uh, it's funny. You know, it's probably a good thing because 
I, I was wondering, you know, like a lot of these guys do motocross as well. And it's like, I'm like, man, I tell you, if you get hurt, because, you know, a lot of them aren't really, it's not like they're racing the M's, you know, or uh, Lucas Oil. But yeah. it's like if they get hurt, it's like that could be implications on their, you know, AMS oil snowcross season. Yeah, for sure. And that that was another reasoning for me not wanting to race anymore is, um, I mean, the year after I stopped racing, I still rode at home. And then um, I just didn't want to race anymore because there was nothing that I knew I wasn't going pro. Like I knew I wasn't going to go anywhere with it. So I just, just accepted the fact that I, I wasn't going to, going to be a a professional motocross racer so um kind of gave up on that and yeah i mean i just just accepted the fact that i wasn't going to be good on a a dirt bike and um i didn't get paid doing it so my my real my real job was racing a snowmobile and i wanted to do everything i could to make sure that i was in uh, perfect shape to be able to to do that and i wanted to make sure that i was healthy too and um yeah i think it was kind of a reality check for me and just to to realize that you know there, there's more to it than than just going out there and riding your dirt bike because i mean as an athlete we all just want to be the best at what we're doing so if we're going out there for to uh to just ride around on a dirt bike we're not going to just go out there and ride around on a dirt bike we're going to try to try to go faster than than everybody else that's out there and um yeah, I mean, we're we're just gonna keep keep trying and keep working harder and harder, and then, I mean, if you have the talent, then then that's awesome. But um, unfortunately for me, I, I didn't have that talent, so uh, kind of kind of had to let it go at the end. So yeah, it's funny. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm 49 now, but uh, <laughs> about five years ago, I had I guess you could get a midlife crisis kind of a deal, and I yeah. uh, went out and got a bike, and I had raced since you know senior minis. 125s when I was a kid back in the 90s and but but the thing is my mentality on the bike was it was there and uh I crashed really hard my my wife you know at the time was my fiance and I didn't come off the track right away so I made her nervous and it was kind of a one and done a back in the retirement (laughs) but yeah uh, Yeah. but, but yeah but you've accomplished quite a bit man uh you know you were what sport champion 16 17 Mm-hmm. And then, yep. uh, your, what was it, your first year in pro light, 17, 18? Uh, yeah, yep, 17, 18 was my first year in pro light, and um, I was fortunate enough to be able to fill in on uh, the team that I race for now. Um, and then the year after, my second year in pro light, which was uh, 1920 or, yeah, 1920, I, uh, or 18, 19, sorry. And uh, I ended up winning the championship that year, and the following year, um, I tried to, to back up my championship for um, the uh, for Pro Light, and the season started off really good. Uh, probably, I think at the beginning that, that was probably the most races I've ever won. Um, I think I've won probably at, at one point I had won like 28 out of 28 races. So, um, so that's with heat races and finals and. Um, I mean, things were just going really well for me, and it was almost like it was it was too perfect. So um, the bad luck was bound to happen, and uh, I mean, it was just kind of it was it was unavoidable at that point. And uh, yeah, we we got hit with some bad luck, and um, actually, it was at Deadwood. That's kind of that's kind of when it when it all kind of started, and uh, bummed my shoulder in practice. So I like to <laughs> I like to to joke with my uh, my fiance and. My, my future father-in-law because the morning of Deadwood of, of Friday at Deadwood is I, I went up to him I went up to my future father-in-law and I was like hey I, I just want to talk to you about um, about your daughter Andy and, and I was like I, I'd really like to be able to to date her and she told me that you know if anybody wanted to date her that they'd have to go through through you and um, so I mean, it was it was the best day of my life because I got the okay to date his daughter. But then after that, everything just started to go downhill. <laughs> nice. So no, but I like to joke with them about that. And I mean, it was it was just bad luck. And you know, we're all out here um, just kind of we're we're trying to live out God's plan for us. So um, for me, I'm I'm just gonna I try to trust God and recognize that. That, you know his way is way better than mine and um you know i just gotta trust his will and 
um, yeah, just just kind of do what he has planned for me and, and take it as I go and just trust him for the most part. And uh, yeah, I can't 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 put too much on myself because I mean, without him, none of this is possible. So um, yeah, just grateful to have a have a true and uh, loving God and um, yeah, just just grateful to to be able to live this life. Yeah, it's nice, man. I I, I love watching. So. Um, but yeah, so you finished fifth this year, top American, I believe, right? F- fourth this year. Oh, yeah. fourth, man. Oh, sweet. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty cool to to be able to look at that, and you know, obviously fourth isn't it's not what we work for. Um, I I was hoping to get something, get a better uh, better result, but the way that the season had gone or had gone at that point, um, it was just really up and down, and. Um, I was happy to be able to finish the season strong and um, to to be the top American too. That's pretty cool. So I'm uh, definitely happy about that and just uh, just really motivated for next year. Yeah, no doubt. You know, because hey, look at it. when Pro Light right fifth that first year and champion the next. Maybe yeah, we, maybe we could pull that off. <laughs> yeah, that's the plan. That's that's kind of what I was shooting for. <laughs> All right, man. No doubt. So hopefully a healthy season for you. You know. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um. So you try to do a little bit of fishing at all? Uh, I do. So my dad and I usually go out. We go out to like uh, the Heartland Dam here, which is just a dam in town. And then when I was younger, I used to go. We have a brook down behind our house, and we, uh, my neighbor and my brother and I would always go fishing. And uh, we'd just go down there, bring a little fishing pole, bring a bunch of worms and i mean we'd spend probably hours at a time just just down there we'd go down in the morning and then come back at at sundown so um yeah i mean i think a few times we caught probably 20 to 40 fish and um yeah i mean we just we just enjoyed fishing uh we'd catch the little ones and, and and bring them up and then cook them and eat them and um yeah we were just we were just having fun as little kids cool yeah so it's probably tough for you to get into that ice fishing that time of the year when you're <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so. So uh, before I let everybody go, I usually tell them to tell a campfire story. You know, it's a story they love to tell about an experience while hunting, fishing, or even being in the outdoors. Like, uh, you know, a big thing I, I was telling one of my buddies, I was like, he said he does a little bit of fishing, but for the most part, because like I said, my love for snowmobiles and growing up with them up in, you know, up north. Um you know, even if it's about sledding, man, shoot shoot away. Oh man, man, I got a couple good ones. I got a, I got a few good ones, or at least one good one for for fishing. Um, I think just being able to go go fishing down in the brook behind the house and being able to spend time with with our neighbors and um, with my brother and you know we we were all we were just little kids going out there trying to be little rednecks, I guess, and, and try to catch fish and. I mean, we tried a few different funny things, and, and we tried to uh, tape, a, tape a fishing line to the end of a stick to see if that would work. And I mean, we caught a few fish doing it. So, <laughs> uh, you know, we just had fun with it as little kids. And then uh, for sledding, I remember going trail riding with my dad. And um, it was, this was way before I started racing. This was a few years before. Um, and uh, I'd fall asleep. I'd be sitting in front of him and I would, I would always fall asleep right on the gas tank. And then as soon as I started racing, whenever I was sitting and staging, I would just put my head on the gas tank and I would fall asleep. And that was kind of, I feel like that was, that was my, uh, my sort of safe place, I guess, when I was a younger kid. And just to be able to, I mean, I had a, I think I was born with a natural love for, for snowmobiles and, um, just being on a snow machine. So, um, just to be able to, kind of grow up on a snowmobile and, and be able to ride with my dad and I'm just always feeling safe and then you know being able to uh to do the same thing when I was getting ready to race and um yeah I mean that was that was kind of a weird thing that I used to always do and people used to think that something was wrong with me and my dad would always be like no he's fine he's he's just sleeping <laughs> people are like why well, sleeping right before the race that's but, awesome uh, yeah, that's. I'd say that that'd be my campfire story. There. Cool, man. Yeah, so it's it's almost like meditation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Just kind of reminiscing in and and uh, yeah. I mean, now nowadays I just I I get ready and and I'm I'm walking up to the line and standing behind the the starting line and you know I got my heart's pumping out of my chest and obviously you have those nerves and um 
walking around the track, you're just thinking about what you're going to be doing. And um, now I, I'd say my, my favorite thing to do is just bow my head and uh, thank God for the opportunity to be able to to ride and live this life and, um, you know, just, just pray that uh, something that I do speaks to, to somebody else and um, something that I do or say uh, helps them with whatever they're going through. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think snowmobiling right now is what, what I'm put on this earth to do, but I know that that's not everything. And, um, you know, there is obviously a life after racing. And, you know, I'd love to be to be somebody that, change somebody's life from racing a snowmobile uh, i think that'd be a really cool really cool experience to have and um definitely want a, a goal of mine and um i think that's something that i want to try to pursue uh later on in, in my snowmobiling career and um honestly now too i kind of want to just be able to get involved more with uh with the younger kids and kind of bring them into it and, and help them with whatever they need and i know with covid now it's, it's pretty pretty restricted but uh you know, I, I I really enjoy working with the little kids and um, just being able to talk with them and, and hearing what their goals are and uh, trying to to make them better on a snowmobile. Nice, that's cool, man. So hopefully, like you said, with COVID, hopefully you guys will be back in New York. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. It's all it's always nice to be able to have a have one race that's semi close to home. So yeah. hopefully, we'll be able to get another one in New York. So you think it'll go back to normal this year? I think so. I mean, from what I'm what I'm hearing, I think things are going to start to go back to normal. Um, yeah, hopefully, it'd be nice to be able to get a few more venues in there and uh, be able to kind of spread out the races a little bit more too, and not just stay stuck in that Midwest. So yeah. it'd be cool to be able. I think we we definitely need the circuit really needs a uh, um, a race on the East Coast for sure. No doubt. I agree. <laughs> well, Hunter, man, I appreciate you coming on tonight. It's much appreciated. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, right. Just uh, thank you for having me, and uh, it was a lot of fun. All right. Thanks a lot. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that was great having Hunter on. Uh, much appreciated for him taking the time out to do the phone interview with me. Um, like I said, I love snowmobiles, love watching snowmobile racing on TV. It's kind of funny too, uh, you know. I, I also watch Supercross. I grew up on dirt bikes, but uh, it's amazing. Like when I ask people who are into motorsports and like motocross, and I was just talking with a good friend of mine, Chris, the other day, and you know, he he knows of snowcross obviously, but he just doesn't watch it as much, and it kind of shocks me they don't have the following. I don't know if it's because you know. Supercross and motocross are like a fair weather sport, you know, but, um, you know, Chris also rides snowmobiles, so, but, you know, maybe this, it'll really take off. I know there's a big enough following, but it's just, you know, to me, it's like, it's almost as important as me watching Supercross or, um, motocross for that matter. So we're going to, so we're going to wrap this up here, uh, but yeah, you know, every week I go over, a little bit of DEC news from the NCOM police. So I guess on April 16th, a guy was caught by ECO Johnson, who uh, had some herring, and uh, they were actually out at night <laughs> taking uh, herring in a tributary, which, you know, if you're out at night, I'm, I'm, I don't think you can actually plead the old I didn't know. And... That's the thing, you know, I don't know if I've said this in other podcasts, it's like, you know, these resources, Air Force, I call DEC police all the time. This past weekend, I was on there twice, um, you know, just to find out the regulations. Uh, one's a good friend of mine, and, uh, you know, just to check it out and, you know, make sure you're doing the right thing. I mean, there's a hotline, too, that, you know, can get you uh, an officer right away. So, I mean, to not do it, I mean, but let's face it, a lot of these, you know, stories that you hear about, you know, just shady stuff. I mean, there's even another one on here about a guy shooting a bald eagle. It's like, really? <laughs> you know, it's like, that's a dirtbag move, man. You know, it's just like, I don't understand some of these people, you know, and uh, I think it, it gives all of us a bad name. Right, right away, like about the guns, you know that that alone, let let alone you're shooting an eagle, but uh, you know it's just crazy. They uh, saw another one where 
they gave out 40 tickets, you know, for uh, people poaching walleye, you know, during the spawning. Just amazing, you know. And I think I brought up in the last podcast about, you know, people like they're posting pictures of bass. And it's like, I understand it's catch and release and, you know, but let's face it. It's not like you're on a big lake going for trout and you caught a bass. To me, like, there is that kind of a little bit of, like, kind of targeting, man. <laughs> but, I mean, that it is what it is, man. I mean, I get it, you know. Like, I was out. I, I, I definitely talked about this on the last podcast. You know, I was out on the reservoir, and we were targeting trout. And because the uh, smallmouth bass are actually spawning around this time, you know, they were just majorly aggressive. And we caught quite a few so but uh just want to like you know uh thank all you guys that have been listening to the podcast i actually got some feedback on facebook um it's much appreciated you know uh without you guys you know i wouldn't really have a podcast you know if obviously if i was looking at my analytics and there were zero people watching that i'd probably lose interest real quick but i've been pretty happy with the numbers and just also, I'm just, I'm really excited just to talk to the guests I've had on, you know, it's, I thank them very much because it's a pretty big deal, you know, like I enjoy what they do, like whether they're a writer, um, you know, hunter riding the snowmobiles, he does some fishing as he was telling us, um, but, you know, just everybody that's been on the podcast, I thank them as well. Um, so guys, you know, check out the podcast, other episodes, you know, I know I've been all over with basically different kinds of things. Like one was the Falcons and rattlesnakes. So I know I've been getting feedback from people that are interested in that particular thing, but hopefully like everybody will find all my podcasts interesting about, you know, uh, hunting, fishing and outdoor adventures. Cause that's the part of the outdoor adventure where, like I said earlier, you know, like snowmobiles have been a big part of my life and, you know, that's, that's an outdoor adventure to me. I've had a lot of great outdoor adventures on snowmobiles and eventually I think I'd like to, uh, you know, I used to do some rock climbing when I was younger. Nothing too serious, but we used to definitely scramble around and have a bunch of friends that are really hardcore into it and they uh, rock climb the Shawangunks. So, you know, in the future, I'd like to get some rock climbing people on here as well. Um, but, you know, hey, subscribe. Keep listening. Hey, you know what? Here's another day. Like I said in my first episode, this is not about me. I hope I, the well never dries up on having guests because, like I said, it's even the average Joe. Um, reach out to me. Message me, man. We'll sit down. If you're local, it makes it a lot easier for me. I don't mind traveling a couple hours, you know, and we'll sit down and we'll do it together. Or the, otherwise, hell, if you're in California, we could do a phone interview. Because <laughs> the funny thing is, I, I, it's pretty interesting to me is I definitely have listeners out Salt Lake City and uh, Sacramento, a lot of different cities, man. It's pretty wild, you know. The analytics is pretty crazy when I really look into this stuff. It's amazing how you can actually. Uh, see who's listening yeah like one of my very good friends you know he, he's like oh yeah great podcast man and then he fessed up last week he's like I, i've been so busy i haven't had a chance to look at it you know and uh the funny thing is it's like i pretty much already knew that because his little town in the city he lives and never showed up on my analytics so it's like you can't lie man <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, like I said, guys, reach out to me even if you have any questions or if you have a great show idea and maybe I can make it happen. Book page, and I also have an Appalachian Timber Ghost Outdoor Adventures Instagram. Hit me up, man. All right, I just put out a new. Uh, actually, check out my YouTube channel as well, Appalachian Timber Ghost Outdoor Adventures. I just put out a new Cajun catfish recipe on there i got a bunch of stuff on there I don't, if anybody ever checked it out um i got recipes got a couple fishing trips uh that we went on so i'm trying to get the ball rolling on my uh channel as well um you know definitely videoing stuff is a lot harder 
Um, especially if you listen to my podcast with Cleed Spooner, you know, where like he talked about, it's just easy to push the camera to the side, but when you're doing it for a living, you really have no choice but you know to hook it up and. So, like, I've been out striper fishing, and I've been humping all my gear down to the riverside. And uh, I'm probably going to put it on my YouTube channel. I did catch the catfish. Um, had a couple runs with the stripers, but damn those fish. My buddy Teddy, Ted Cousin, man, if you're listening, shout out. But uh, it's like I have not been striper fishing a lot. But I've dabbled in it over the years, and it, it's kind of funny, man. I have never caught a striper yet. I've had a lot of runs. Uh, I'm doing it the right way. Like, I know how to catch them, but it's just funny. I, I tell a story about um, I was with, like, five friends one time down at the Hudson River, and same setup, same everything, buried right in the middle of all these dudes and the their poles were just going crazy. They were landing stripers, and lo and behold, old Glenny boy couldn't <laughs> couldn't get one in. So, uh, pretty crazy. But next uh, podcast, usually I try not to give away who's going to be on because, like I said, if I can't land them, um, but for sure I'm going to have Ron Rohrbaugh. On, and he's a traditional bow hunter, and he's written a book. He was, he's done a lot of stuff. So, and he was actually on the Meat Eater podcast uh, with Stephen Ranella. I th- believe it was episode fifty-one. So, stay tuned for that. That's going to be a good show. All right, guys. Well, checking out. Peace out. Talk to you all next time. Message me. All right. Later. This episode of the Appalachian Timber Ghost Outdoor Adventures podcast was brought to you by Wild Kingdom Soap. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram. I'm gonna probably going to put it on my YouTube channel. I did catch the catfish. Um, had a couple runs with the stripers, but damn those fish. My buddy Teddy, Ted Cousin, man, if you're listening, shout out. But uh, it's like I have not been striper fishing a lot, but I've dabbled in it over the years, and it it's kind of funny, man. I have never caught a striper yet. I've had a lot of runs. Uh, I'm doing it the right way. Like, I know how to catch them, but it's just funny. I, I tell a story about um, I was with, like, five friends one time down at the Hudson River, and same setup, same everything, buried right in the middle of all these dudes, and the, their poles were just going crazy. They were landing stripers, and lo and behold, Oh, Glenny boy couldn't <laughs> couldn't get one in, so uh, pretty crazy. But next uh, podcast, usually I try not to give away who's going to be on because, like I said, if I can't land them, um, but for sure I'm going to have Ron Rohrbaugh on, and he's a traditional bow hunter, and he's written a book. He was. He's done a lot of stuff. So, and he was actually on the Meat Eater podcast uh, with Stephen Ranella. I th- believe it was episode fifty-one. So, stay tuned for that. That's going to be a good show. All right, guys. Well, checking out. Peace out. Talk to you all next time. Message me. All right, later. 
This episode of the Appalachian Timber Ghost Outdoor Adventures podcast was brought to you by Wild Kingdom Soap. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> <laughs>